Now, question number five, what if I'm not an influencer? What should I do with social media? How should I think about social media marketing? That's a great question, right? So 1% of the practices that I have seen out of my 500 practices do extremely well with social media because they are influencers. Those five or less than five are influencers. So 99% of them don't get any results. How do I know this? Because we track the results through phone tracking and lead tracking. And so we know what's actually happening. So the 99% don't get more than a, one new patient a month from social media because these call tracking numbers, that's what the data that we are getting. So if you are in that 99% who is not going to get new patients from social media, then you have to ask the question, why am I doing social media? Obviously, you're not doing it to get new patients because your stuff is not going to get shown just the way the algorithms work because you're not an influencer. So then what? Um, like we kind of alluded to earlier, uh, you know, you can get reviews on social media platforms. So maybe pay attention to it. So if there's a nasty review there, deal with it. Um, encourage people to, of course, write reviews on Google. But if they also have a, Instagram, a Facebook plat you know, account, have them write reviews on Facebook. Continue to post on it, right? But I'm going to give you some guardrails, right? Because I, I get people think they're still in the early days of Facebook when Facebook first came along. And this thing I just told you when we started this episode where you have a page, you have a thousand people liking that page, half the people see what you post. Those days are dead. Only 10 people will see what you post. So don't waste your time doing what you what worked for you when Facebook was brand new today. So I say the guardrails are put no more than an hour a week, number one, or $100 a month. Because if you're going to spend more than an hour a week or $100 a month, you're not going to get the ROI. You're not going to be able to justify it in terms of new patients, which is going to be, you know, best case one, unless you are an influencer. You know, Niran, I'm going to add to that a little bit. I, I agree with everything you said there for sure. I'll add to that, though, and say that um, maybe for a more typical uh, dentist practice owner, one of the ways to think about social media is a place for your community to connect with your practice. You know, once a patient becomes a patient in your practice, the website, your 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 website, which I think of as the home base, would you agree that uh, for, for Dennis, the, the practice website is the hub of your marketing? Absolutely. And the good news is you own it, right? As opposed to Instagram or right. TikTok or even podcasts, like the one that Gary and I are doing, we don't own it. It's owned by Apple. So we don't know what's going on. We don't get data. Like it's just all hidden. It's a black box. Right. Well, but after a patient becomes a patient, um, for most patients, there's not a lot of value on the website. You know, yeah. once a patient's become a patient uh, and maybe we direct our existing patients to your social media pages uh, for a way to stay connected with the practice, to find out what's going on, what's happening, what's new and great about dentistry. Um so maybe that's another way to think about it. Not so much marketing, but provide it as a community building platform for your community of patients, your, your family of patients. Would 100%. you agree with that? I would agree with that. But I do see, just like I told you, there's 1% of my clients who are these influencers. I also have maybe 2 to 3% of my clients who are very big on literally groups. What I mean is Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups. So like there's a literally, I have a client he was coached by somebody, you know, and he spends a lot of time in the local Facebook group, uh, you know, for moms. And he would answer questions that moms are having with dentistry. And uh, somebody flags these questions and he would jump in and answer and say, oh, this is what I would do. So over time, that group of 10,000 moms know who Dr. Johnson or Smith is, right? And they, they know he, he's caring, he's, uh, he's always helpful. And now they, they remember his name. And they trust him. And of course, once one of the people who are members of the 10,000 person community will come and say, oh, I just went to see Dr. Johnson. He's amazing. He's all that I thought he's going to be. And his team is amazing. They're so caring. They're so, you know, so helpful. Now those 10,000 moms start seeing that. And then the second mom rolls in, the third mom rolls. So that is one way, if you have the time, that won't take 15 to 20 hours a week, maybe five hours a week, maybe an hour a day, just looking at all the posts and just commenting and being part of the community. Of course, your signature should say DDS, DDS, so people know you are a dentist and maybe include your website. Uh, so that that's that's the other way that's I would use it. That's a great um, Yeah. The groups have really uh, become an important part of the social media landscape. Yes. Uh, at least Facebook groups, for sure. Um, yes. Speaking of platforms, um, let's talk about platforms, which, which plan let, let's, let's name some, what are platforms that are useful to take a look at for dentists? Yeah, I think the top 
three are like top two is definitely Instagram and TikTok. And then maybe a close third would be Facebook. You could argue maybe Facebook is and TikTok are kind of the same right now, but definitely Instagram, I think, is is the king. But remember, unless you are an influencer, none of these platforms will work for you just because look at the number of people who at least for marketing. For marketing. At least for marketing, at least for getting new patients. Like Gary said, it might be a great way to stay in touch because in the old days you send them newsletters. Now they can go to your Facebook page and see what's going on. Oh, somebody celebrated their birthday. You had an awesome 87 year old patient who came in and such a wonderful human being and everybody likes her. And everybody. So, so you can just stay in touch, kind of like telling your story, like writing blogs or in those mm -hmm. days, you know, like, so just telling your story so they can, you know, pay attention to your story. But that's only if they go to it on their own because then they're, they're not going to be seen on the feeds. Yeah. So keep in mind, it's not going to really drive new people to you. It's the people who are taking an effort to go to your Instagram page, usually like your existing clients who will see it. Um, that's a great pivot there. And uh, thinking about what we used to, you know, I, I've been in dentistry long enough to remember when we used to do newsletters mm -hmm. and we would actually print those out and send those out. Later, we uh, many practices converted those newsletters to an email type format. Yes. And maybe a more efficient way to do all of that is to think about your social media pages as a way to put content that you might have put content in newsletters in the past, kind of warm, fuzzy, keeping dentistry front and center for people, and then celebrating your community along with that. What, what about some of the more abstract um, social media platforms? Um, uh, I, st I still think of it as Twitter. It's now called X, um, LinkedIn, YouTube. There's three. What do you think about those? Yeah, so I have one client, of course, I'm not going to name her name. Uh, she has a huge YouTube following. She worked on it. She's a social media maven. She's just like, she eats, drinks. She can teach social media, and but it, it's a passion. She spends a lot of time doing it. So she has a lot of people on it. What she told me is um, the challenge with all these social media platforms is they don't target a, 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 an area. Like if I live in San Francisco or Phoenix, I'm not going to get patients or people seeing me from that town. Rather, it could be the entire world. So one thing she quickly realized is if you're going to start building these, if you're as a one percent to start building these audiences, whether it's YouTube or whatever, you need a way to monetize it. So the way she monetizes YouTube is through ads. So once she's like, if she puts a hundred uh, in a video, a hundred thousand people see it, she can run ads. YouTube will run ads and YouTube will share the revenue with her. So she makes half the money. So slowly but surely that's building up, you know, two, three thousand dollars passive income. Now, then the next question is, how do I monetize it? You know, beyond ads, of course, you need a product that has a global you know, presence. So maybe uh, like I know a couple of my clients, you know, they're selling health products, you know, a special kind of a toothbrush. Um, you know, there's one client who wants to teach social media. So because there are tens of thousands of people who see her as a social media expert, she's trying to create a course. So you need to figure out a way to monetize it, but make sure this product is not something that only person in your community can consume, but rather anyone in the world or anyone in the country can consume. You raise Otherwise, a really good point in that social media is a worldwide platform yes. where practices, practices can certainly have a wider geography. Right. Um, doesn't have to be just a neighborhood practice, right. but in reality, um, most dental practices um, truly do have a geographic component to them. Yes, uh, meaning that the patient needs to work or 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 live relatively near the practice. One hundred percent. There's exceptions to that. I I have uh, clients in my coaching work that uh, clients will come uh, cross country yes. for very specific high value services. You know, a, a cosmetic dentist that's extremely well known. Uh, for the quality of the aesthetic dentistry and patients will come from around the country for that. But those are more outliers than, uh, than, than common. Now, question number seven, this one came from one of our Thriving Dentist Show listeners. Uh, Naren, what is your opinion of practice posts that are provided by social media marketing companies? Absolutely. I mean, there are two types of marketing companies in social media. Still, there are a lot of doctors who don't understand how social media works in 2024. In other words, they don't understand that if you're not an influencer, you're not going to get new patients. So they are still thinking, oh, social media is, 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 is a way to do things. And they will go and pitch these doctors, oh, give me $10,000 a month or you know, $3,000 a month. And I'm going to run a bunch of ads. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that and whatnot. But one thing they don't do conveniently is tracking. So there's no tracking on how many new patients we are getting. Doctor is like, oh, I got you know, 10,000 people saw me. So because they're throwing stuff against the wall yeah. and seeing what sticks. 
Yeah. So except it, they don't know have a way to track what sticks. Yeah, there's no tracking. So uh, this is a true key story. Like one of my plastic surgery clients in New York, you know, she has been with us for 15 years and she wanted new patients. So she said, Hey, we have we make a lot of money. I'm gonna throw some money into social media. She has a social media company and they said, Okay, five grand a month, I'll do this, I'll do that. And then finally we started tracking the average person from social media was spending five seconds in out, in out, because these are all ad driven. They didn't want plastic surgery. They were shown an ad when they're watching a cat video about a plastic <laughs> surgeon who can do breast implants. What are the chances of them like wanting to do that? What are the chances? You know, anyway, so it just became like absolutely unproductive. So, so if you are caught with one of those companies, they're like, oh, give me money. I'm going to do ads. I'm going to do this. I'm going to run the whole thing. Ask the question. I want to be able to count the number of new patients I'm getting from it. If I cannot, then I don't want to do this. So make sure you're measuring it. But then if the social media company is you know, relatively inexpensive, less than a hundred bucks a, a pop, and they're at least giving you good quality posts, like, you know, 4th of July, you know, Thanksgiving. Seasonal things. Seasonal, uh, education. Maybe some educational exactly. content. Uh, maybe there's some um, dental uh, treatments that have been in the news. Exactly. You know, yeah, because they can't give you personal content. They don't, they're not in your practice. They don't know somebody had a birthday. They don't know your 87 year old patient showed up. That you have to do. That's where I said spend an hour a week, you know, posting things that are, you know, relevant and personal to your practice. Uh, assign a champion. Gary has this concept of a champion. So maybe have somebody who's your social media champion. It's her job to at least post once or twice a week, something really happening in the practice. And then the third party company could just give you these generic but high quality generic posts so that way you don't feel like you're ignoring your page. Yeah, and a combination of um, provided posts that are provided by quality sources along right. with truly original posts. One of the posts for Life Smiles that I remember as being um, uh, going viral uh, was during the month of February, uh, Paul, Dr. Nielsen, and his wife, Erin, would go out to their kids' Uh, classrooms during Dental Health Month, National mm -hmm. Dental Health Month, and they would put on a puppet show for the kindergarten and first grade classes where the kids were at that school. And they would put on a puppet show about dentistry. And right. it was Dr. Paul and Aaron. And uh, anyway, one of our team members went out and, and took some photos of them doing this. And, and then they wrote the post from the third party perspective. We're so proud of Dr. Paul and his wife, Aaron. Um, for investing their time and energy and helping uh, educate the youth of today about how important great dental health is. And that that post, I'm describe am I describing that in a way that makes sense? Yeah, here? absolutely. That one went viral. Um, but that was a very unique post and it was, uh, you know, we didn't do it to, to get a viral post. Uh, we, we did it to show that uh, Dr. Paul and his wife, Aaron were committed to the community. Absolutely. Um, but that was an example of one that that worked really well. So it leads me to the next question, Nared. This is something every dentist should be asking, not just about social media, but how do I know if I'm throwing stuff against the wall, doing a bunch of different things, how do I know what part of my marketing is working? Is it just enough to say, well, we're getting new patients, so apparently that's good enough? No, I really think you need metrics. Like I, I'm a huge fan of call tracking, so you know, set up different call tracking numbers. So if you're running, if you're going to spend 3000 on social media, that should have a separate number. So try to figure out how many phone calls are coming in. And then and I, can, I can attest this, Darren, because of, as a client of Equa, yes. uh, your marketing firm, we know precisely, precisely where every new patient came from. And exactly. if you don't have that, I would suggest you're operating from um, a disadvantage because you don't know what's working. And if you don't know what's working, you don't know what to do more of. And if you don't know what's not working, you don't know what maybe you should be doing less of. Yeah, to give you an actual case study, like this one particular client was spending $25,000. The minute we started putting call tracking numbers, we realized $20,000 was just not doing anything for him. In other words, he, each patient was costing like $3,000 a patient. Or like not only not making money, they're losing money. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like, in other words, it's, it's like instead of it going into the, the doctor's personal bank account or profit account, it's going into some marketing company's pocket and there's no results. So once you know where what's working and what's not, cut all the things like Gary said, that is not, that's working you the least. You know, why waste money on something that is not giving you the most results? 
Well, I, I, I'll have a, a kind of a continuation of that question. What if the phone's ringing? So yes. potential new patients are calling, but they're not converting to a scheduled new patient. What, what's that about? A hundred percent. That's a, that's an awesome question. And um, I have experience because of our mutual clients. So one of the benefits of uh, call tracking is you have the data, but the problem with call tracking is so much data. In other words, you can't really do anything unless you're willing to spend 10, 20 hours, especially to see how the phone is being answered because you need to listen to 100 phone calls and so forth. So one of the things I know, Gary, you provide with your coaching service is you listen to those calls, meaning you and the team listen to those calls. It takes around 20 hours a month just to go through each call. And then they do three things. One is, what's the call conversion rate? In other words, if you're getting 10 new patient calls, did you book all of them or did you book five of them? right? Five is, you know, 50%. Can, can I benchmark that for our listeners now? Absolutely. Get it. We, we benchmarked that. Remember the grading uh, system we use in elementary school? Yes. It's not that same A, B, C, D, F grading scale, uh, but it's a similar concept. So what I'm going to give you is a, a call conversion percentage. What call conversion percentage means is what percent of potential new patients who call your office end up scheduling a new patient appointment? 70% or above is an A on the report card. 60 to 70 is a B on the report card. 50 to 60 is a C. And we say anything less than, than 50 is failing. And it's really important to get that right. Because if we can, may, maybe your problem isn't marketing, meaning you're getting enough calls, but you're not converting enough of those to new patients. Uh, and we've had great results uh, there in, in, in our mutual clients. You provide me the call data information. Yes. I then select six calls, four good ones and two that need work. And I work with any of your team members that answer the phones on skill building. So they're more effective at dealing with those calls. Uh, Naren, remember my grade scale? So we have a, a, a client, a mutual client of ours, that when we first started working on these calls, his call conversion rate was 25%. What's that grade on the report card? Uh, F, I mean, like F minus. <laughs> yeah. And we got it to 75%. What's that grade on the report card? A. Well, if 70 is an A, I might argue 75% is an A plus. Yes. He was getting 50 new calls a month. And before we started with this training, he was converting 25% of those, which were 12 new patients a month. He needed right. more than that. After the training, over time, we got him, you know, steadily increasing. We got him to 75%, which now means 38 new patients a month. For the same marketing spend, he didn't have to spend any more money to get more calls. He just had to do a better job with the calls he was getting. Yeah, that's like a 300% improvement, right? Imagine getting 12 new patients versus 38. That is like a game changer for the practice. I remember that doctor actually telling you, Gary, I know you do so much more for me, but if this is the only thing that you did for me, it more than pays for my you know, coaching uh, with you. So he was, and it's, it's not easy though. I, I mean, we are simplifying it, but it took you months and months and that practice months and months to go from 25%. To well, I might argue, Naren, it took me, uh, well, we started this in 2007 uh, at, at Life Smiles. You know, it, it, it took 17 years of evolution yes. to learn how to effectively coach. It, there's an art to it. You, you, you want to provide guidance, but you don't want the team members to feel beat up. Uh, right. You know, there's a way to do it. Uh, by the way, I'll give a self uh, a gratuitous uh, plug. Uh, if any of you are, are interested in learning about what we do in coaching, which would include, uh, you know, call training, uh, schedule a uh, uh, a coaching strategy meeting with me. Uh, you can go to thrivingdentist.com forward slash CSM. That'll open up my calendar. You'll see an appointment time, pick an appointment time that works for you. That'd be a Zoom call between you and I. My goal is to learn more about you uh, in your practice. Um, and then if you'll allow, I'll share a little bit about our coaching to see if it might be a good fit to work together. But if you're curious about how you're doing with your calls, um, I'd love to uh, help you get in the A-plus leagues on that because that may make all the difference in the world. Now, and the last question I have is uh, if SEO, search and organic search engine optimization, is the best way for a doctor who is not an influencer to get new patients, where should they start? Yeah, I mean, if you are willing to spend 15 to 20 hours and you love social media, of course, keep doing that because that's going to work for you. But if you're like the 99% of the doctors who's not in that 1% of influencers, then SEO is 
a great place because it can be done for you by somebody else. In other words, you can actually get somebody else to do it. Now, in our work, um, 100% of our clients by the end of year one are ranking for 100 or more keywords, meaning they are showing up on the first page of Google results for 100 different searches, 100 different phrases people type into Google. So like example, dentist near me, you know, dentist Phoenix, you know, uh, teeth all, all the different ways anybody in your community would use to not only search for a dentist, but maybe search for a particular services. Exactly. And I can attest to that last month. I look at my numbers every month. Last month, um, I believe we, we uh, crossed 900 uh, keywords and key phrases. I think it was 904 keywords and key phrases that we were ranked for on page one when someone in our area was looking for a dentist. So now that's seven years of work that you guys yes. had put into that it was an overnight success. But uh, within the first year, you're going to be uh, seeing fantastic results and it simply gets better and better uh, uh, from there. Uh, Naren, I'd like to invite our listeners um, to uh, schedule um, a marketing strategy meeting with, with you, with uh, your firm, Equa, to learn more about how they're currently doing with their marketing um, and to learn what they could do to massively improve their marketing. If they simply go to equa, e -K -W -A .com forward slash uh, MSM, stands for Marketing Strategy Meeting. Um, and you do that as a courtesy for any of our listeners, there's no charge for that. Um, and I'll simply share uh, what I tell my clients. Um, we've been an Equa client for seven years. I have uh, never seen better results and I'm spending less than I ever have. And I love both of those outcomes. Better results in terms of number of new patients and my spend um, is a fraction of 1% of our revenue. Um, if you'd like to see those kind of results, uh, uh, talk to uh, schedule a marketing strategy meeting and find out how you can put equity to work for you. Naren, thank you. You've kind of peeled back the onion here um, on social media marketing. I, I think maybe the, to answer the question, does social media marketing work for dental practices? It absolutely can, and it can have a very uh, useful purpose, but in terms of whether it's an effective marketing channel or not, um, really kind of hinges on whether uh, the doctor has aspirations and, and talent and ability to become an influencer. If so, go for it. Um, if not, maybe look at some of the other, social, uh, other marketing channels such as organic SEO, uh, which can be done for your practice uh, and doesn't require that uh, Herculean lift on your part. Is that a good way to kind of put a ribbon on our episode today? Absolutely, Gary. That's a, that's a great way to, uh, you know, end this episode. But I, I, just the last word uh, from my perspective is, uh, you know, it's good for you to understand the, the world in 2024, right? The world keeps changing. So don't do something that was a great idea 10 years ago or five years ago today. Just ask the question, what is right today? And then do the things that will help you get what you need.